and traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, and particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continuing use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. We thank you all for tuning in. I wonder if any of you were actually with us earlier for the 6 p.m. event with Michael Ian Black and Mike Berbiglia. At any rate, if you're a doubleheader tonight, we especially appreciate you. Town Hall is grateful for the opportunity to invite Seattle audiences into present tense exchanges of issues, ideas, and creativity, even when we can't do it in person. Town Hall will continue to produce online content throughout this fall and into the new year, and as circumstances allow to even host live streams from our building. Meanwhile, if like me, you just can't log quite enough hours on Zoom or YouTube, know that many of our past talks are available in video or podcast form under the header digital media. But back to tonight, the program will run likely about 35, 40 minutes, followed by a Q&A. Derek and Catherine will take questions from the ask a question field at the bottom center of your screen. Please keep them concise and we'll get to as many as possible. Also know that you can view the event both here on Crowdcast or over on our YouTube page if you want to utilize that platform's closed captioning feature. Um, just know that it's easier for us if you pose your questions over here. Town Hall is adding new events and podcasts every day, like tonight's event. One of the upsides of our virtual season is uh, the extraordinary conversations it makes possible. Ron Chu and Naomi Ishisaka on the foundational role of Asian Americans in Seattle. Eddie Cole with Sean Scott discussing the influence of college campuses on the struggle for black freedom. Jane Fonda and Elizabeth Lesser on women's activism to bend the course of climate change. And our digital programs make possible a reimagining of arts events as well. Our Town Music Chamber series kicks off this week with cellist and artistic director Joshua Roman returning to Seattle for a 10-week residency called Fermata, celebrating an artist's creativity between in-person concert appearances by sharing audio and video glimpses of composing, practicing, listening, rehearsing, resting, all within the context of a massive cultural and social pause. For more information about Fermata and all the rest, visit townhallseattle.org. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Civics programs in particular are supported by the Real Networks Foundation, True Brown Foundation, KUOW, and the Wincoat Foundation Northwest. But as most of you know, Town Hall is at heart a member-supported organization, and I want to thank all of our members for watching tonight. Newsflash, not exactly. This is an unprecedented time for nonprofits. And if you're not yet a member and you support Town Hall's mission to make ideas and inspiration accessible to the whole community, we hope you will consider joining us or making a donation through the button at the bottom of your screen. And to conclude the infomercial portion of your evening, this isn't an easy time for booksellers either. Since we know you'll want to spend more time with Derek's book, I urge you to buy your own copy here, now, tonight, through our local independent partners at LA Bay Books using the conveniently positioned button at the bottom of your screen. All right. Derek Black is a professor, a professor at the University of South Carolina Law School where he teaches constitutional law, civil rights, and education law. His current focus is the intersection of constitutional law and public education, and he's a well-known and outspoken advocate of the importance of public education. Prior to teaching, he litigated issues relating to school desegregation, diversity, school finance equity, student discipline, and special education at the Lawyers Committee. His writing has been published in professional legal journals as well as the mainstream media. He was a contributor to the book Charles H. Houston, an interdisciplinary study of civil rights leadership. Hold the line. <laughs> published in 2012. And his first book, Ending Zero Tolerance, The Crisis of Absolute School Discipline, was published in 2016 and describes irrationality and inequality in school punishment. Catherine Dunn is a regional policy analyst for children's rights at the Southern Poverty Law Center. Previously, she served in the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights in Atlanta and was a program director at the Southern Education Foundation, where her work focused on research, advocacy, and organizing to promote equity in public education across the American South. Black's book, Schoolhouse Burning, Public Education and the Assault on American Democracy, is the subject of the discussion tonight. Please join me in welcoming Catherine Dunn and Derek W. Black. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks to everyone there at Town Hall and Shane and, and Bruno and where, um, you know, these things are, are not easy uh, to put together for, for those folks watching. And so thanks for all the, the great help they did. And thanks uh, to Catherine. Uh, we're both on the East Coast. So appreciate her uh, uh, joining this conversation at, at probably the time she, she might rather be sleeping. So. Um, better better late than early for me. I'm a night owl, and thanks so much to Town Hall for um, for hosting us. It's really an honor to be in conversation with you, um, Derek, about this important new book about public education and, and our democracy. And um, 
there are many reasons why, you know, I'm personally motivated to read this book as somebody who fights for education justice and as a Southerner who believes in the South um, and also fights for it to be better. Um, and somebody who's concerned about our democracy, um, probably today more than um, other days even. Um, so can you share with us why you were motivated to write it? Yeah, I mean, probably a lot of the same reasons you're motivated to do, to do your, your day job. But, you know, I just kind of felt, I mean, first of all, as I say in the opening, you know, public education um, really is that intergenerational inheritance that, that we pass on from one to another. And particularly for, for children who can't expect an inheritance in the traditional sense, this is what America gives them or not, right? And, you know, I certainly know that in my life that this was the inheritance that I received and it made the difference in my life. And, you know, oftentimes the public school system wanted more for me than I wanted for myself. You know, didn't didn't have much privilege at home. You know, I don't know what, you know, sometimes it felt like special treatment and sometimes it just felt like people doing doing their job. And so, you know, one, I come at this from the perspective of, of feeling that, you know, uh, I need to make sure that I pass on that inheritance to, to other kids. And, you know, also talk about coming from pretty unique community in Clinton, Tennessee, which is the, the place where uh, Clinton, Tennessee's traditionally white high school is the first in the United States to graduate um, an African American. So it was the first place that um, Thurgood Marshall got uh, a desegregation decree following Brown versus Board, and his simple request was to let, you know, a dozen African American kids walk off a hill uh, and attend Clinton High School. Now, of course, that was that was before I was there, but that that history was sort of part of my experience as well. So, you know, that sort of puts me in the uh, that doesn't really explain why I wrote this specific book. I think. You know, the reason why I wrote this book is the same reason, you know, you get up and work hard every day is that something has uh, dramatically changed in, in the last uh, last decade, at least, that we really have seen our public school system under siege. And, you know, I didn't feel at the time that there was enough pushback against that, at least on sort of the common person's level sort of communicating to where real parents and real teachers are at. And, and teachers were incredibly long suffering. I and mean, I talk about that in the book. I mean, um, you know, they, they are not social justice advocates, not, notwithstanding, you know, the president's claims that they're teaching, you know, leftist uh, ideology, you know, they're there to serve kids and, and they don't complain and, and, you know, go make a ruckus at, at the polls, right? They just take it and they suffered through a recession. And I just felt like no one was really standing up for them. And so just as they finally uh, had had enough and started to, to stand up and protest uh, in red states, not in blue states, but in red states in, in the South, I said, let, let me see if I can add something, um, add something to this conversation that, that maybe equips them a, a little bit more to go out and, and advocate for themselves and gives them a bigger picture of the historical foundations upon which they stand as they go out and do that advocacy. I think the, the history um, in the book is so important as we are sort of grappling with the role of public education in, in this country, you know, in this moment is kind of understanding um, the, you know, what our values are as a country and um, the role that public education has played. And, um, so for me, I think that's a really important part of the story um, in your book. Um, but what was the story that you were that you were hoping to tell readers? Well, well, yeah, I had to give you know Matthew Carnicelli, my my um, agent, a lot of credit here. That you know I started out trying to write a policy book. You know I was mad in the same way that you're mad. Teachers are mad, and I was just want everybody to understand the policy implications of all of this. And, you know, he, he, he kind of told me early on, said, you know, Derek, you, know, you got a lot of good stuff to say, but no one, no one wants to read that. <laughs> no one accepts that reference. Um, and, you know, you, you need to find the story here. Like, you know, wh how do you communicate this on, on a broader level? And, 
you know, there's also is I think uh, you know you and I as civil rights advocates, we take a lot of history for 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 granted. You know, I remember telling him at, at one point, well, you know, I, I I litigated school desegregation cases, and you know, I know you know the Brown v. Board and subsequent story really well, and that's been told you know a hundred times, and nobody wants to read that. So I'm just going to deal with that stuff in just a couple of pages. And he said, no, 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 no you're, you're not. You know that 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 there's more there. So you know, uh, what started out as a policy book really becomes a story of America as seen through the eyes of its public schools and, and, and how the public schools are, are trying to be part of helping America be what it what it wanted to be. And so as I, you know, as I got towards the end of the book, I almost wanted to to just take out the first and the last chapters, which are really the, the policy chapters and go, you know, who cares about Betsy DeVos and, and, and who cares about Arnie Duncan and teacher evaluation? Like there's an important story about America to tell here. Um, and so, but of course, like, no, 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 right? There's, you can't leave them out of the story either. But I think it is a story of America um, and, and that is a story that ultimately told. And I think it's an important one, um, you know, and as I say in the book, talking directly to the reader in a few places, I say, look, you know, I'm about to tell you a story that if you tell anyone else about it, they're not going to believe you, right? because we have this narrative about education not being in the federal constitution. We have this narrative about it not being a constitutional right. And, you know, I walk through a history that I say this flies in the face of of, every, of the conventional wisdom. So I think that's an important story to get out there so that we, you know, I mean, Trump says he wants us to sort of teach American exceptionalism. I mean, I think the story of this book with all of America's warts and failures is a story of American exceptionalism. And we don't have to whitewash it to make it exceptional. And so I think that's another important piece uh, of the book as well. I agree. I mean, you know, I'd love to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the your your debate about keeping the DeVos and Arnie Duncan piece in, um, you know, and why you think that the great kind of, um, you know, um, uh, history that you lay out in here relates to the debates we're having right now about DeVos and really what what our education system is in this moment. Um, you know, why do you think that the, that the, that pairing ended up being really important in the book that you published? Yeah, I mean, so I, I think, as, as my editor said, you know, the reason why you're telling this story today, Derek, is because of what's happening around you. And so you can't leave today out of that story. And I said, yeah, you're right. Um, my thing was like, this story, at least as I tell it, is so grand that I actually... I don't want to. I don't want to muddy it up with with these other small town players who are interrupting, you know, a longer historical arc. And so that was sort of an internal battle uh, of my own about, um, you know, not giving these sort of minor players more credit than they deserve. I mean, there's no doubt they're doing damage, and so to talk about the damage is important, but to to repeat their nonsense, you know, along right along the side, you know, the Thomas Jeffersons and Adams and, and Charles Sumner, you know, famous Massachusetts Senator, you know, right alongside them sort of felt like wrong. But, you know, I think the, what the book does overall, which, which is the, the real sort of thesis of the book is that you cannot understand or we cannot fairly evaluate what's happening in real time based just upon data or our sense of right or wrong. And I said, look, we need a much bigger historical lens that allows us to view today and say, are we moving in the direction that we've been trying to move for the last couple hundred years? Or are we taking a, a detour or a U-turn of, of some sort? And, and as I say in the book, all the, the, the test scores in the world are kind of irrelevant on these normative questions of, of how you build democracy and how you bring the people together and what its values are. Like, you know, um, our schools represent, right, equality. Our schools represent uh, anti-discrimination. Our schools represent an openness regardless of your race, religion, creed, language status, disability, you know, on and on and on, you know, 
where you know the, the, the poor man or the laborer's son or the laborer's daughter might one day uh, go to class with the CEO's child and maybe become president of the United States, right? And those aren't about test scores, right? That's about an idea of America. And so, you know, I'm trying to bring this conversation back to first principles um, and instead of getting muddied up in a lot of these sort of minor, relatively minor, you know, policy debates sometimes. And I think the work you're doing, which, you know, go ahead and tell, tell, tell everyone about that important work, I think is, you know, it is a fight, right, for the sort of core values about where we put our public dollars at. Yeah. Um, I, I'd love to get into the work, but I, like, as we, as we're talking about um, the history, I have, I, you know, it was fascinating to go through and, and I felt like I knew some of this history. You know, my first job out of law school, I went to the Southern Education Foundation, which has its roots, you know, all the way back to 1867 um, when it when it was established by George Peabody and other philanthropists to open up schools for four million enslaved folks in the South, and and really was instrumental in in the work to then get our state governments to establish um, a system of public education in the South. And um, but I learned a ton about the freedmen in your book, and would love to learn about why that was, um, you know, such a focus for you and. Um, you know, your your journey and learning about the freedmen and writing about them in this book. Yeah, before I jump in, I'll just say, yeah, some of the, some of the documents that, that I have in, in the book or some of the research certainly was archival material from, from the Southern Education Foundation in that history. So, um, so yeah, de definitely an integral part of that. But, yeah, so before I even started writing this book, I'd written this article in, in the Stanford Law Review, um, about what I call the constitutional compromise to guarantee education following Reconstruction. And, you know, Southern Poverty Law Center um, and your colleagues there have been litigating around, you know, Mississippi's readmission to the Union, which which is part of the story I'm, I tell in the, in the book. So I'd written that article and, and I thought it was uh, a, a pretty big deal for the historical and, and legal insights I was making there. And but if you, if you read that article and if you just read that part of the history, what you really see or what you could argue it was 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 white folks or white powerful folks in Washington D.C. telling um, a story about what America was to be, right? Sort of a sort of a one-way conversation of, of Charles Sumner and and presidents telling the South, you know, this is how you need to do it, and. What I found by re going even further back in time and, and looking at while the Civil War was still going on, uh, even before the end of the Civil War, was there was obviously a conversation happening amongst the slave community right, that was part of this story and that Washington, D.C. and others didn't just think up the idea of constitutionalizing public education in the South because they thought it was a good idea. They did it because uh, African-Americans and former slaves were demanding it for themselves. You know, and even as I talk about it now, you know, I, I, I'm getting chills to a certain extent, right? I mean, some of those stories in there, um, they're, they're, they're almost hard to believe. They are almost hard to believe. And, and I actually questioned a lot of those stories. Like, were these missionaries who are recounting? So a lot of the stories in there um, were written by uh, missionaries from Philadelphia and New York who went south before the war was even over, and and began teaching in places like you know, uh, St. Helena's Island, in South Carolina, and then Fort Monroe and, and Virginia. And I thought, are they just like spinning a narrative so they can get more donations to have more missionaries come down? And so there was part of me that was always a little skeptical. But I read enough sources and I read enough um, first person accounts and diaries and also military accounts uh, by generals that we say, now th this, there's no story being spun here, right? That African Americans, um, uh, they really at that point call them contraband, right? And sort of in the middle of the war, African Americans are not free yet, right? Even if they make it behind enemy lines. And, and, and to relate it back to you know the work of the 1619 project, so 1619 is is, is the year in which uh, first slaves land in Fort Monroe, Virginia. Um, well, ironically enough, my book picks up in that very same location 
uh, Fort Monroe, Virginia in, in 1862 and says, this is also the first place that African Americans became free. And it was before the end of the Civil War when they thought that maybe on the other side of that bay and that fort that they wouldn't be slaves anymore. And so they flee to Fort Monroe in, in Northern Virginia. And as soon as they, they were free, although they were called contraband at the moment, they, they wanted to read. They wanted to learn to read. And all the generals are sort of taken aback by how much they want to learn how to read. And this story gets repeated over and over and over again in the South. And, and the story, the stories are just bone chilling. And I'll just share a couple of them. You know, there's a guy in Louisiana um, who he had joined the African American uh, slave who had joined uh, the uh, Union military and was helping fight in Louisiana. And his children were still behind on, on the plantation. At that point in Louisiana or in, in, the, in the Civil War, the North decided that it was best to maintain stability of the economic system, which meant right, slave, you know, formal slavery may not be occurring, but people still need to be working, I guess, or at least staying there. And so this, this former slave who's in the, in the military goes to a white man colonel in the Union Army and says, um, you know, my sons are uh, about 15 miles away or something, and, and I would like them brought to me. And the colonel responds to him and says, well, you know, they're, they're, they're fed, they're clothed, you know, this, this is an army installation, like, this isn't a place for them, why would, why would I, no, we, we shouldn't do that. And his response is, I want them to come here because I want to teach them to read. And then the colonel says to him, um, well, I'm not going to do that. And his response, this is quotes from the colonel is, you know, I fought in the battle of X. I wear the union, you know, uh, uniform. Those are my children and you will bring them to me. Right. So this idea that they were seizing freedom and saw public education, as being our education at that point as being the way to freedom, you know, is there before the end of the war. And then after the war, I won't belabor it, but they began making demands of Congress and of their states to form this public education system. And in Arkansas, I, I tell about how the African American community, you know, literally collected the money to keep the schools open for the rest of the year. And after they did that, they demanded that the state fund them and keep them open into perpetuity. And so there's just a really rich story that on one level is, is a distraction, arguably a distraction from this core question of sort of the constitutional right to education, but it really is the heart and soul of, uh, of sort of inspiring that, that right. And so, um, so yeah, I sort of fell in love with, with that story. I can understand why. I mean, you know, I, I, um, the book had me thinking a lot about, um, you know, how we talk about freedom um, and education and what, um, you know, education means in terms of freedom. I mean, I think, you know, we're in this moment right now where um, freedom is, is framed sort of as, you know, the absence of government, right? Like we have all these stay at home orders and mask mandates and, and people are saying that that's, you know, a, a violation of their freedom. Um, DeVos is like proposing these um, education freedom scholarships, right? Tax credit vouchers that all are all about just looking out for um, the individual. And I think your book does a really good job of, um, you know, talking about how the system is, is really required to, you know, freedom as really security. Everyone has the security of a good public education. Um, and I think understanding how, um, you know, that the idea of freedom as government getting out of the way and just looking out for the individual is really just a messaging tactic. Um, Cause your book talks a lot about how, um, you know, Southern white elites understood the connections between education and, and freedom and really power. Um, and, you know, before reconstruction were resistant to, you know, establishing systems of public education because it meant kind of ceding their power. And we've seen, you know, I think education reform, um, follow in in that you know in that way like after after brown we saw um vouchers used as a tool to um really you know evade segregation but also to maintain power um and i think you know 
uh, when I was at the Southern Education Foundation, uh, one of the first pieces that I worked on there, um, this was 2009, was a report that found that the majority of students in public schools in the South were for the first time ever and in, in the first region ever in the country were students of color and were also a majority low income. And that was the time that all these Southern states really started um, enacting this new wave of private school vouchers and all these, you know, sort of nefarious forms, indirect vouchers that, um, you know, divert taxes to private schools. And, and we saw them really grow over the past, um, over the past decade. And I think understanding that that's, you know, it really is about power, but is framed as sort of this, you know, individual freedom to get to decide where you go to school um, while, while disinvesting from the, the system. Um, was, was really helpful for me to think about in terms of, you know, looking back over the past decade being in this work, um, fighting for public schools. Um, I would love to hear kind of what lessons you, um, you know, take from the past decade of this uh, education reform wave we've been in. Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, I, I didn't realize you'd, you'd worked on on those reports. That, that's, that's good to know. And you also reminded me that, uh, that I had that in the book as well when you mentioned it, because, you know, there is, you know, putting lots of different pieces together is hard when you're, you're you're so close up to things. But North Carolina, I talk about how it really, you, really, you sort of look at the what they did with public education funding, what they did with charters and vouchers, what they did with voting, and the fact that North Carolina had just tipped over, right, and, and that sort of um, majority poor um, um scenario there that there, there's a lot going on I and mean, you you sort of put those factors together you know you sort of understand that in North Carolina in particular and I think you know uh, Reverend Barber obviously has, has been talking about the war on on poor people uh, as a general matter in North Carolina and, and nationally but you sort of put that all together and you clearly see with those data points that I have that there is this status quo that is trying to maintain political power in the state of North Carolina by squeezing, you know, poor people and people of color's education. Like when they do that at the ballot box, everyone sort of screams and yells and understands that that's what they're doing. And I don't think many people fully appreciate that they're doing that at the schoolhouse door as well. I think you can see that very easily. Um, in, in North Carolina, you can see it in the maps that I have, and uh, you know, in the book, the sort of lineup where, where privatization is, is is really heavy, and in our you know places and uh, in, in, in former Confederacy, and then also in the Southwest, but yet where we have um, you know predominantly white states, there's no privatization there at all. There aren't any charter schools there, right? These things only exist in these places where is this 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 contest over power right and this is the means by which by which to keep it and um yeah so um and that's what makes it that's what makes it so troubling you know i point out in the book that there are I'm not really answering your question but you, you stoked some ideas but you know there's these there's two points there's only two points in history prior to today in which there has been an assault on public education and one was following reconstruction when slaveholders wanted to take back control of the South and reduce African American second class citizenship. And they did that in two very straightforward, simple ways segregating schools, underfunding African American schools, and disenfranchisement, right? Those were, it was a two pronged strategy to reduce African Americans to second class citizenship, right? So that's, that's the, first time in history in which we actually start to go backwards on, on public education. Fortunately, you know, the poor whites in the South, which, which you mentioned, they got a little bit of public education out of that deal too in the South. And, and they said, no, you know, I don't think so. In fact, there's a wonderful story um, about Mississippi, ironically enough, that after they had passed their, their segregationist and sort of defunding public education constitution, that the white attorney general, right, a um, uh, segregationist himself, said, wait a minute, actually, we went too far. And he actually sued to try to undermine some of the defunding because people were upset when they figured out how much public education had been defunded during Reconstruction. But so there's that one moment in time. And the other one, of course, is the one that you mentioned following uh, Brown uh, 
uh, and, and the cases that, that that came along with it, where they wanted to voucherize, you know, education and close the public schools. And again, it was it was actually um, you know, the suburban white moms in Richmond, Virginia, who said, "Look, you know, we're we're not crazy about integration. We're not crazy about black folks, but if our public education." and black folks will keep public education, right? And so we've got two moments in time when, when public education comes under assault, really for racist reasons, quite quite clearly. The racism is there and isn't extinguished, but public education survives. What makes today different and more dangerous is that we still have this sort of racial element, but this time they're actually going after public education. It's not, let's segregate the school or let's, underfund African-American schools. It's let's do a public education altogether. And it is getting more traction than it has ever gotten before. And if you buy what I have had to say about how public education is part of our democratic project, and you buy that story that I told about North Carolina, if we allow this sort of assault on public education to, to move forward, we are putting our entire democracy, or at least the values that our democracy uh, rests upon at risk. And I think people need to appreciate this. This isn't just about what's good for your child or sort of lowering the cost of your private education or your taxes. This is about democracy. It's always been about democracy and, and it's about democracy today. Yeah, I mean, it does feel like, um, you know, as you talk about the low points that we've been through in public education, there was still um, you know, a, a sense of the system of public schools is okay, but you know, not for my kid. Um, and I think we are sort of at this point where, um, you know, the debate is, is, you know, should we even have the system, um, which is, um, you know, uh, I think, um, certainly if you describe it as a crisis, and it feels that way. Um, I mean, you know, how would you kind of compare um, where we are in terms of how public education is, is doing um, you know, relative to these other low points throughout our history. Um, yeah. So on one, so I'll start with the good instead of the bad this time. Yeah. You know, the fact that we had you know fifty thousand people in the streets in the capital of Arizona two years ago it is is unimaginable. That fifty thousand people marched on the state capitol uh, demanding that public education be invested in and protected. So that gives me a lot of, of, of hope. You know, in South Carolina, we had 10,000 people in a much smaller city, smaller state, but marching on the Capitol in, in Columbia. And that was the largest protest we've had at the, at the Capitol. Um, I don't know if it was the largest in history. It's certainly the largest on public education that, that we've ever had. I mean, the, the next biggest thing was about 1,500 1, or 2,000 school teachers back in the 70s um, who were complaining about discriminatory pay. So, I mean, there's an enormous outpouring uh, of sort of support for public education. And again, you know, not not by, not in blue states and not just a bunch of blue voters, right? I mean, you know, I tell a lot of story about sort of Trump voters and Republican heavy states, right? That, that they are upset by that. So that gives me a, a lot of, hope right? that, that, that the people who realize what's at stake are, are finally realizing that they've got to fight for it in the way they have it. On the other side of the ledger, you know, they, did, they didn't talk about public education in the presidential debate last night, but this is the first time that public education has really been on the, on the ballot, Richard Nixon. And Richard Nixon was really the first time that he'd been on the ballot forever. And that's because education, public education, is a bipartisan issue. I mean, you like no child left behind, no, whatever. 80% of Congress voted for it, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Senator Kennedy co-sponsored the bill, you know, with, uh, you know, the, the Speaker of the House on the, on the Republican side. Chair. So, like, this is not a divisive issue. And that was, um, you know, we had... A lot of stuff that was was done, you know, in that been done in Democratic and Republican states. So ninety percent for that. We decided with the terrible bill, you know, not too long after that, and we finally replaced it with the Every Student Succeeds Act. Again, during one of the most partisan moments in history, right? I mean, President Obama after the Affordable Health Care Act, there was no legislation 
past. And they, could, they could not agree on the time of day, right? But in 2015, everyone says, we got to come together and do something. My God, we're all going to get fired, right, if we don't do something. Is there anything we can do? Yes, we can reauthorize the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And 90% of the Congress, right, in the last year of Obama's sort of divided, you know, difficult government period, 90% of Congress, you know, signs off on this thing, right? So the point simply being is no matter how bad things have been in the past, we've been able to come together and pass this type of legislation at both the state and federal level. But if you look at the two candidates today, there's not a sliver of agreement between them. Nothing. And this is the first time, you know, since Nixon that you've seen that wide of a gulf between the parties. You know, and Nixon was really driving a, a wedge on race and segregation. It wasn't really about public education per se. So now we have a situation in which the president's platform is twofold. Give every child in America school choice, by which he means private school choice. And so he is willing in his platform to remove every single child from the public school system. And number two, if any of you stick around there in the public school system, we're going to eliminate your radical leftist, you know, make you hate America sort of curriculum, right? He wants to throw all of it away. And, you know, again, he's Donald Trump. We, you know, he says lots of, of things. But, you know, as you know, during the, during the work that you've done in, in LC and, and Florida and, and elsewhere, like, you know, he has a gravitational pull that has moved a lot of, of Republican governors and speakers of the House in his direction in a way that we just haven't seen before. And so that is very scary um, that, you know, th there is, you know, Southern Poverty Law Center is winning cases in the courts. We are not winning that many, not your job, but we're not winning that many at the state house right now. Right. And, um, and so that that's a very scary thing. Yeah. I mean, um, the, the work you're talking about is, you know, I think, um, part of a partnership that we established a couple of years ago, public funds, public schools, which is, you know, specifically to counter this, this vision of, um, you know, private um, school vouchers for, for every kid. Um, and, you know, I think we recognize that the courts play a role, um, but ultimately, you know, you have to really have an integrated strategy um, to fight back against vouchers. So, you know, we we do try to combine, you know, the the legislative fights with the court fights. And really, I mean, it's it feels so much like a messaging war, um, you know, around um, public education and this narrative about, you know, failing public schools um, and, you know, again, freedom as, um, you know, um, the the option um, to guarantee, you know, that no child is kind of, you know, confined to the school in their zip code and they, they have choice. And, um, you know, it's, but I think it lacks, you know, a true conversation about the history and how, you know, some schools have really never been funded to, you know, um, really be able to provide the education that um, we know that they can when they are fully funded. Um, and so I think, you know, it's something that, you know, I think we need to all be thinking about in, in our work because the other side is um, extremely well-funded. Um, you know, I think there's, um, again, this, um, you know, this recognition that with education comes freedom and power, and there's an incentive for folks who have been in power in this country to um, maintain that. And um, so, you know, I think we're, we're up against a lot of funding, um, a, a really difficult uh, narrative, um, you know, in, in, in um, uh, public messaging around this. Um, and I think, you know, ensuring that we are sort of responding in, on all of these fronts is, is critical to, to our work, um, even though court fights are, are useful, to, you know, a useful part of it and sometimes, uh, you know, result in some exciting victories. Um, what do you see, I mean, I guess, as motivating the attack on public education? Well, I mean, it, it is, I guess we could give them a lot of credit for coalition building, right? <laughs> Because it's really a diverse constituency, right? We we have we have the libertarian that, that would say this really is about you know sort of just choice, do whatever you want to, whether it's you know another public school or a private school or a charter, whatever it may be. So you sort of got that group. Then you've got your sort of anti 
tax folks who, you know, to use Grover Norquist line, they want to shrink the size that you can drown it in a bathtub. And, you know, at the state and local level, um, public education is by far the largest, you know, budget item that, that our taxes go to. So if you want to shrink state and local government, you're talking about shrinking public education. So for them, I think it's about taxes, right? And there, that's the ideology that, you know, kids like me and my family who couldn't afford to pay for their own education, that they're, they're mooching off of, you know, the wealthy folks down the road and, and they've got to cut that out, right? And so, so you've got that, that crew, um, you know, you, you've got the sort of purist, I think, right, which is this choice. And you've got the religious, uh, the religious element that, you know, believes that our schools are, are sort of anti-religious and they don't want to be forced to go there. And, you know, without you know, getting into religious debate, I mean, I can, I can understand that they're, they may be coming from, from an honest place that's a, a little bit harder to contest, right, that they have deep convictions and, and I can appreciate that, you know, whether you and I should be paying for that, you know, that's a different question, but I sort of understand. So you've got that group. And then the group that I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic to, which I always have to acknowledge, and, and you know in your work, is that, you know, there are African American and Latino communities, Native American communities um, across this country that for never one moment in the history of America has had a state that was fully committed to delivering them an adequate education. So, Derek can talk about constitutional rights and constitutional commitments all all he wants. I've never seen that in my neighborhood. Yeah. And I sec I certainly can't second I can't second guess that. Right? I can't second guess the reality that that they have been abandoned and mistreated, and it's sort of like you know pick your poison, you know. And so I, I sort of understand that. And my only response to that is, who should we be pointing the fingers at? Is, is it really the local school district who's at fault here? Or is it, you know, the state of Mississippi or the state of South Carolina or whoever, right? Um, and the reason why these schools are underfunded and unequal and, and segregated is because of the state legislature. It's not because, and certainly local school districts engage in nefarious and have various behavior, but they do it under the authority of the state and in terms of funding that is completely controlled by the state. And so I just find it incredibly ironic that the state that refuses to provide an adequate public education um, would come and say, hey, we're here to help you. We really care about you today. And what we want to do for you is give you freedom and freedom you will find in, 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 private, in, in private schools. Um, and, and that is, that is, uh, I think that's quite disingenuous from, from the state legislatures who've never once provided an adequate public education to suggest that they're really out to serve the interests of, of disadvantaged children. So, you know, it's a long-winded response. Say that, you know, there, there's a, there's a, there's a big community there. And then there's also the profit margin, you know, profit motives that, that, that motivates some of this as well. And they've all finally gotten themselves together uh, under a tent. Um, they, they weren't able to do it for quite a while, but they have now gotten themselves together under a tent, partly through creative messaging, uh, as, as, you, as you suggest. Yeah, I, I mean, and you know, it feels like sort of all of these levels have some responsibility, right? I mean, the states like you describe in your book all have you know, constitutional responsibilities to provide education and, and so much of our work is about, you know, ensuring that they are actually adequately funding, you know, these systems of public schools. Um, but part of also like, I think the, the beauty of public schools is that we can hold them accountable. We can go to our local school boards and, um, you know, show up to meetings and, um, you know, um, ensure that they are meeting the civil rights and non-discrimination requirements that, they're, that they are obligated to um, meet for all students. It doesn't always happen, but I think we have this this accountability um, at multiple levels that doesn't exist outside of the system. And that choice is really, it's really the private school's choice, right? Um, and it's, it is pitched as, you know, sort of, um, you know, again, that individual choice. Um, and, you know, um, uh, you know, I think it's often described as, 
you know, the accountability is is with where parents choose to go to school. But that choice is really it's it's the schools at every level, um, you know, which students they admit, how much they charge, which students they keep, um, you know, and public schools are really there to serve every kid all the time. Um, and, you know, again, I think that that accountability makes um, you know, it, it's sort of like we, we can have this um, tough love aspect to our work, right? Like we believe in the system and believe in what it can be for all kids and know that, you know, states are obligated to provide it, but we can also force them, you know, push them to be better, um, which as you know, you know, they've never been as, as good as they need to be for all kids in this country. So um, I'm gonna ask you one more question. And while I do that, I just wanna remind folks um, to pop any questions that you have in the chat. I'll bring in um, folks from our audience after uh, the next question. But, um, you know, we're in this um, this moment of COVID. You and I are doing this event virtually. And, um, you know, what do you see as, um, you know, next for public education coming out of COVID? We're obviously, um, you know, schools are in a very difficult moment of, um, you know, moving to remote learning and then figuring out when and how to reopen uh, for students and education is something a lot of people are thinking a lot about these days, um, whether they're administering, you know, virtual learning to their kids or what, but um, what do you see as next? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that is the tough question, you know, because it, it changes every day. Um, you know, back in, in March, I, I posted something and said, you see, you see how important these schools are, everything's falling apart. Right. And, and we sort of have the, you know, all these different constituencies talk about how important public schools is. And I said, okay, maybe this is this magic moment where and we're having to teach our own kids. It's like, man, this is this is tough, you know. Uh, these teachers really work hard. They're not just twiddling their thumb all day and and realize that it takes a long time to get stuff done, right? And so it brought sort of the reality of public education came came home to us. And I thought, well, this is a good thing. But, you know, humans, particularly during a pandemic, um, can own, you know, we have a hard time processing things outside of our own wants and needs. And so, you know, into the middle of the summer, you know, the public schools all of a sudden become the enemy. You know, you hear Secretary DeVos and the president, you know, uh, talk, you know, all of our problems are really the result of the public schools because they don't want to open and they're lazy and they're unions and that, 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 all that stuff. And so they're the enemy, and as you know, right, they use that sort of demonization of the, of the public schools as the lever to, you know, get my governor here in South Carolina to, to start a voucher program. And same thing in Oklahoma and New Hampshire. And, and then, of course, you, you've been fighting, uh, Southern Party Law Center fighting in Tennessee over that. And so, you know, what seemed like a moment for us to appreciate education three months later is one to, to demonize it. And so one lesson to take from this is how hard or how dangerous it is to, to make any prediction on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, you know, I have a little bit in the forward of the book and a little bit in the end of it that says, you know, we have to, again, back out one more time and look at this from a very large historical framework, long historical framework. And what I say is, going back to those dark moments following um, Reconstruction and, um, the civil rights movement, that it, that it actually is our commitment to public schools that have carried us time and time again through dark moments in history. It is our public schools that have time and time again expanded democracy and the right to vote and inclusion to people who were shut out before. And so that history suggests that we have something that's been handed down, our inheritance that can do that one more time. But, you know, the past is not a predictor of the future, right? None of those things were preordained and none of those things would have happened without, you know, the uh, Southern Education Foundations of the world, the LDFs of the world, sort of individual African-Americans putting their lives on, on the line in the South during Reconstruction. So, you know, these things don't happen without a fight either. And so I guess what I realize is that we have something that can – help us get to a better place when this is all over, but we got to fight for it. And I guess the last part of my long-winded response, you know, tonight, right before I came on, a teacher was 
talking about, you know, how can I teach constitutionalism to my eighth grade civics class? You know, how can I have my students watch that debate last night and, and, and do something good with it? And I said, look, you know, at about an hour in, you know, I just told my son, you know, we're not watching, you're not watching, I didn't, you're not watching this thing. That's not how adults work. You know, it's, it's time to go to bed. And, um, and so that was it. Right, we probably should have all taken. Yeah, we probably, but I said, look, you know, but our constitution has always been an idea that we've tried to get closer to and it, and it relies upon the effectiveness of our constitution, our commitment relies upon the good faith of everyday folks and legislators. And what we have seen exposed in the last few years is a lack of good faith by our public leaders. And, you know, outright bad faith in many instances. I talk about that in the book. And so I said to her, you know, before we got on, I said, look, I think this just shows how important your job is, that what we need to be modeling in our public schools every day is basic civics and a basic good faith commitment to the rules and to each other. And, you know, like, you know public schools have never been perfect, but it is that thing. It is that sort of uh, ethos that, that gets us through these times. And so I do believe that if we can see our public schools for what they can do as a tool for bringing us together, not the tool of a president to, to divide us, then I think they can help us continue uh, to, to a better place. But again, we got to fight for it. I don't see a question in the um, in the chat yet, unless I'm missing it. But please, um, please add your questions, and I um, have more for you, Derek. So we can keep going. Um, I think we'll think about a long response if they're afraid to ask questions. <laughs> Not at all. Um, so you know, I think um, we haven't gotten uh, into you know kind of where where the courts are on. Um, you know, this uh, issue of education reform and vouchers and charters and, um, you know, I think some of the disinvestment in public education that's resulted. And we talked a little bit about, um, you know, the pandemic that we're in. And I think one reality is that, you know, our, our um, education budgets will likely suffer. Um, so I'm curious, one, you know, if you have any predictions on how state Supreme Courts um, will react to um, folks, you know, challenging um, this underfunding of public education um, as violating the state constitutions? Um, yeah. Well, following the last recession, we had a rough, we had a rough few years. You know, states were, were gouging twenty percent, twenty five percent in some instances out of the public education budget, and just about two, yeah. two had dramatic effects. And, you know, education and civil rights advocates were slow to sue because I think they were afraid that courts wouldn't stand with them in the middle of what was, you know, a, a free fall in the economy. Like, the court's really going to tell states that they have to sort of suck it up and stay, keep education number one in the way the Constitution says. So I think we were a little bit scared of the courts. And... And then when people finally did start suing, there were there were some negative decisions, you know, in 2011 and 12. And I wrote an article that said this may be the beginning of the end, and that that that's kind of scary. Um, fortunately, you know, the last five years has been pretty strong, relatively strong, I think. Of course, getting back to basics, Pennsylvania, for instance, having never entertained a school funding uh, claim. I'm, I'm an expert in that case. I probably shouldn't say too much, but now they they. Um, um, you know, they are allowing that case to move forward and there is a cause of action. So, you know, I think my hope, I'm not making prediction, my hope is that, um, you know, the courts recognized the bad faith of the legislatures following the, the, the last recession, how they kept funding cuts in well after the recession was over. And I think we're going to be in a better position to spot that bad faith again this time. And, and I don't know why, but the, the, the government of general, the general councils of governors, all 50, where they had me on a, on a phone call um, a few months ago. And I said, look, you know, a lot of folks gave you guys two or three years to get your act together in terms of meeting students' needs following the last recession. If you don't have a plan and aren't 
implementing it, you know, well by the springtime, I don't think people will wait to sue you this time. So my prediction will be there will be a lot of litigation come springtime, um, and then we'll just have to see what the courts will do. And sadly, I mean, in a lot of states where we work, we still haven't made up um, the underfunding that resulted after the last recession. And so I think we're going to be in pretty dire situations, um, you know, with additional cuts um, pending. Um, looks like somebody was trying to get in on the chat, but I don't see a question from them yet. Um, Hi, this is Shane from Town Hall. Um, so. Uh, the, our chat is disabled, but feel free to ask your questions using the ask a question button at the bottom of your screen, and they will be happy to take your questions there. It says one unanswered down there, but I don't know if that, oh, that just says the same. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, let's, let's like talk about something positive, right? I mean, what, what, um, what next? You know, I mean, we talked a little bit about what next following COVID, but in general, what do you think we need to be doing um, to, you know, build a stronger system of public education and, you know, to strengthen our democracy in doing so? Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things that, you know, of course, you know as well as anyone, but, you know, our, our schools have been fracturing around race really for the last, since, since you know, the mid-70s, rather right? they've been They've been reset, well, in the late 80s, but, but depending on where you're at, but sort of resegregation in, in, in a lot of places. And, you know, segregation levels, uh, as the you know UCLA Civil Rights Report tells us each year, are higher, higher, higher now uh, than they've been, you know, since, since the late 70s. Um, so I don't think we have to look any further than sort of police, you know, are sort of brutality and, and sort of the protests and Black Lives Matters to understand that like, you know, we've got a serious issue with, with, you know, racial bias and implicit bias in our society and it's not gonna go away by itself. And, you know, what studies told us during desegregation and they confirm now is that, you know, and, and I see it with my own children who, who, who go to an integrated school that, you know, those experiences in elementary school, those sort of cross-racial experiences in elementary school, and not just race, cross-religion, you, know, um, you know, gender balanced, you know, LGBTQ, across the board, like those set life, lifelong, um, lifelong results. So, I mean, one thing you could posit about our problems today is that we did not finish the work of Brown, and we just kind of thought these issues would take care of themselves. Well, they didn't, right? And so part of, I hope, of, the, of this current uh, awakening is that we understand that, that the solution to these problems can't be had very well with adults. You know, it starts with kids, it starts with preschool. Uh, unfortunately, our problems start there as well. You know, I mean, Southern Poverty Law Center, you know, doing school discipline work and, and, you know, the data about, you know, racially disparate discipline is in preschool, you know. so. We've got to work with our teachers on these issues as well. So racial justice uh, writ large in America will, will start uh, where we tried to start it following uh, Reconstruction and, and during the Civil Rights. It, it will be in our schools, right? And we've made some steps forward. We've got further ones to make. The other part of that is, you know, you have to understand that there's always going to be white resistance to that. And if, if whites think that somehow or another their education is being sacrificed to help other people, um, that's going to be a difficult political fight. And so ultimately, you know, part of the solution is making sure all of our schools right, are adequately funded with high quality teachers so that our integrated schools are strong schools um, and that we don't have this sort of fleeing, you know, to communities that have resources and abandoning the other ones that don't. And we've got a school structural system right now that incentivizes segregation, right? And fixing that problem um, it is in part about fixing our school funding system as well. I agree. I mean, I think you know, one thing that I think is really at the, the forefront of the moment that we're in right now is how, you know, not just like how systemic racism shows up in schools, but how schools are, you know, really have been asked to respond to 
systemic inequities in our society in general, right? Like when else does like a, something shut down and like children can't eat or get dental care or do all of these things that we actually rely on public schools for because of systemic inequities um, that exist both in and outside of school. And so, you know, I hope that post pandemic, we can really, you know, reimagine how we how we invest in and believe in our public schools because of all of these roles that they play for children and ensuring that children really have opportunities to to thrive in school means that we must be you know investing in in really a whole child approach in our schools um and i think i think this moment makes clear that you know public schools are really are are playing that role but um, you know, we haven't invested in them to be able to do it fully, um, you know, and, and, and to really fill the gaps that exist both, you know, in and outside of school. Um, thank you so much for writing this inspiring book and to, um, you know, inviting me into this conversation uh, with you this evening. Um, we did get, we have a comment from Karen who says, well, I'm old enough to remember the effect of uh, mandatory busing programs for integration purposes. Uh, magnet schools help in some districts. How do you see this dilemma? Um, we're, we'll do this one question and then close out if that's okay with you, Derek. Sure. Yeah, I mean, there, I've got a colleague who's writing a book on choice and you know, I emphasize to him that um, all choice is not bad. I mean, one of the things that we discovered is that, you know, in the same way that the other side co ops our ideas and our language, we can co op theirs too. Right. And so controlled choice, as I said, controlled choice, controlled choice is extremely effective, right? That Louisville, you know, Kentucky desegregated its schools, not by mandating busing, but by actually allowing everyone in the school district to make choices about where they would go and exercising a little bit of control around the edges. Right. Now, you know, here, you know, town hall, Seattle, I mean, their high school program was a perfect, but they had a controlled choice program that produced uh, substantial integration and I'm sure there's people here that have lots of complaints about you know maybe how that worked out but the short story is is that we can kind of have our cake and eat it too on this issue right that allowing people to make choice within parameters can help us achieve integration and the key thing there and it, it even goes back to what we we're saying about Af what I was saying about African American communities wanting to make a choice of a private school or a charter school whatever it is well, there's a lot of privileged families that if you allow them to make a choice, they become much, much happier. So short story is, you know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of satisfaction and sort of very high popularity in Louisville, Kentucky, right? Uh, a southern state uh, and, a, and a racially sort of equally equal school district that, you know, generally speaking, everyone was on board with this. And so I do think that our old ways, um, aren't always effective, but there are new ways of controlled choice and others to, to make it a win-win for everyone. And so we need to start exploring those. Um, and there's political pushback, you know, um, certainly had it in Wake, Wake County and it wasn't all smooth sailing and removal, but, um, but the overwhelming majority uh, ha has been willing to sort of move forward with those, but we have to have leaders that are willing to get out there in front and, and champion those policies. Well, any final thoughts before we close for the evening? Just thanks to you all for hosting this discussion and Derek for inviting me in. Um, yeah, th same, same here. Thanks. It's been a pleasure to participate in this conversation and, uh, you know, hope that uh, everyone will continue to follow Catherine's work at Southern Poverty Law Center and, and I'll just talk about her work on Twitter. So if you want to know about it, you can follow me on Twitter. Well, thank you both to Derek and Catherine for being here. Um, they're both on the East Coast, so it's pretty late. So we really appreciate you for, for doing this event with us this evening. And thank you to our audience for, for tuning in as well. If you enjoyed this event, you can find many more like it on our website, townhallseattle.org. We hope you'll consider making a donation as your support will allow us to continue to do events just like this one. If you're interested in purchasing a copy of Derek's book, Schoolhouse Burning, Public Education and the Assault on American Democracy, please use the link on this live stream uh, page to purchase through our friends at Third Place Books and our apologies for saying the wrong bookstore earlier. Um, finally, thank you again for being here and have a great evening, everybody.